Well, this is the Encounter Faith Podcast. My name is Ross, and I am so excited that you're with us today because today we are continuing our series as we dive into Exodus, and I am joined by my dear friend, Elizabeth Lecca. Elizabeth, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, Ross. Now, you gave a sermon that we're going to jump into here that was pretty wide ranging. You covered a lot of text over the a pretty short period of time. And one of the things that I really appreciated about it that I want to start first is, you know, folks know this by now, but I want you to click on the show notes, listen to the message, watch the message directly. But you wind up telling the story of the Israelites and telling your part of your story at the exact same time. And one of the things you wind up talking about is how you, God was working in a season of your life where you were dealing with anxiety. And one of my curiosities that as I'm hearing you talk about this, I was like, man, I just haven't heard the word anxiety said that often in front of a church. You spoke about it brilliantly. People need to hear the story and how you walked through it. But just to kick things off, I'm curious, what have been your observations as someone who's grown up in the church much more than I have of why, for lack of a better term, we're not very good at conversations like the conversation you tried to weave through your sermon yesterday. I don't know. I think there's a lot of reasons. Okay, great. Um, Everybody. Thanks for listening. Appreciate <laughs> I think it. There's a lot of reasons, but also um, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm like the expert on it either. I think for me, I grew up at Good Shepherd. So Good Shepherd is my experience. Sure. I don't have a whole lot of other churches to compare it to. And I feel like in general, in student ministries, youth ministry, it's a hot topic of conversation. It has been for very many years. Um, so like, I remember some conversations about it when I was in high school, but it didn't quite click for me. Sure. Um, and I think some, one of the challenges with mental health conversations is that you need people who get it. Mm. You need, you need people who, who get the challenge of mental health, even if they haven't mm -hmm. had a mental health challenge themselves. And you also need people who have struggled with their mental health who are able to name it and talk about it in a way that's helpful with others. Right. Um, and so like when, if you're in an environment or in your small group where you don't have either of those things, that can be really hard if you're walking through that for the first time. You, How do you have the tools? How do you have the people that are helping you to name that? Yeah. And I think when you expand that to the whole church, how do you talk about that in a sermon? Yeah. How do you talk about that? Um, yeah, from from the pulpit, from your prayers, you can kind of slip it in and name it, uh -huh. but it's really difficult to actually explain what it's like or to give the nuance beyond it. Or like, I know that my experience with anxiety is not the same as somebody else's. Sure. And so, when I'm going to talk about anxiety, I'm going to I'm trying to try to temper it in different ways to really personalize it to my own experience rather than making it a generalized statement on anxiety, sure. which I think can be one of another challenge. Yeah. <laughs> another thing that is important to wrestle with in talking about mental health is that every person's experience is so unique. Yeah. And so there's no one size fits all way that we can talk about it. Yeah. Um, we can talk about all the options. We can talk about all the tools. We can talk about medication. We can talk about therapy. But some people have a mental health challenge one time and some people wrestle with something for their entire life and they've tried a million things. Mm -hmm. And it's very difficult to talk about something that has so many distinct features, yeah. <laughs> manifestations yeah. in individuals' lives. And I think that's part of it. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, it's this interesting place for me to start because what I so appreciated about what you did was you were able to, you had the space for it. It's one of my favorite things about being a part of this community is we're able to create space for uh, these kinds of conversations in ways, to, in ways that plenty of churches want to, but may, may not feel equipped to like what you're talking about. And some churches I feel like are frankly actively avoiding. Ironically, this isn't even the heartbeat of your message. What you wind <laughs> up talking about is uh, navigating the wilderness, but I start there because you said, even describing it, some people have this one time experience and some people are navigating it through their entire lives. And I feel like we all are going to have wilderness experiences in our faith. We're all going to have experiences in our faith where we are asking the questions that we see the Israelites asking in that text of, 
uh, a Ross Cochran translation being like, God, what are we doing? Yeah. And yet there are others who their walk with Jesus looks like some key moments, but it's actually uh, to an outside observer might look a lot more up and to the right. I think similarly, we are messages like what you gave yesterday help people feel equipped for those seasons and frankly aren't as talked about enough from the pulpit as they should be. When you're looking at this text and you're seeing the Israelites navigating this, you said something that I want to dive into, which is um, they, they were confident in the certainty of slavery rather than the uncertainty of the promised land. When you are, you serve here as a student's minister, you are on track to be a pastor. When you are connecting with folks, what are the ways in which like a modern equivalent of that? Because I think it's easy for our, some people who are listening to look at this and go, I can't believe they were embracing the certainty of slavery, mm-hmm. but we are, we all embrace the certainty of these things that are holding us back rather than perhaps the uncertainty of where God might be leading yeah. us. And I, one of the reasons that this particular story in this particular season of my life felt like it was appropriate to be shared in this was because it, it felt like that. Sure. Like the certainty of my anxiety in this season, the certainty of, I know I'm going to feel up tomorrow, like get up tomorrow feeling like this. I know that I'm going to be thinking these thoughts. Like, I know I'm going to go for a run and feel better for like 20 minutes and then it's going to come back. There was so much certainty of my situation and I didn't really know what was happening with my anxiety. I knew there was a decision to be made. I knew that I needed to do something and change something. Yeah. But the uncertainty of what would look like next was overwhelming for me that yeah. I wasn't going to do that on my own until I was pushed in that direction. Yeah. Like until I had no other choice. Yeah. Um, because for me, that anxiety like just inflates my anxiety like increases anytime there's a season of uncertainty or a season of change that's about to come yeah like i'm a i'm a pre-mourner is what i call myself a pre-mourner wow. when i know change is coming i'm gonna get <laughs> super 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 anxious until that thing happens and then i'm gonna be fine because i'm gonna think about every single scenario sure. that could possibly happen in that change because um, the uncertainty freaks me out sure so like for me that example, like that's, that's my example for me personally. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, you know, broader examples, it's like, okay, we don't have, don't have like the certainty of slavery, but I think what I mean by that is the certainty of the situation that we're in, yep. the certainty of situation that you're in, whatever it looks like. Um, you know, it, you maybe are feeling that it might not be exactly what God wants for you or, or you don't even have that discernment. It's just kind of like, this is uncomfortable. This isn't working. I'm not flourishing. I'm feeling stifled. I'm yeah. feeling smaller than I should be, but what else do I do? Yeah. Like that's where the sort of walking into the wilderness <laughs> begins to happen because you're, you're kind of being forced or kind of thinking about making a decision and making that decision means you're walking into something brand new. And there's a wide range of things that can fit into that. So when you are sitting with so much of your career thus far has been with students, one of the things that, that makes me think of is the students wind up hitting people, everybody winds up getting to this place of reaching what feels like a binary choice of we're going to keep walking and there's wilderness over here or I can embrace and hold on to the things I already have. What I'm curious about is what are the things that are most helpful in those moments for those students to hear process, be equipped by, because I think in hearing you unpack that I'm picturing the parents who are listening or trying to figure out how to relate to their kid, the in particular parents who are trying to figure out how to help their kids grow up and know and love the church and love Jesus. And this, you use the phrase, uh, something needed to push you. But I think our generation of parents have this tendency myself, very, very much included here to avoid pushing unless we absolutely have to Mm -hmm. in those moments that you've been able to walk through as a, 
trusted adult in those spaces. What has worked well for those kids that you've been in the trenches with them? Mm-hmm. Um, well, I think just think, you know, kind of thinking about the change and transition and making decision in the wilderness. It's like for students, they get to be in high school for four years and then they have to transition. Like, yeah. so, so for, for kids and for students, like there are, there are built in transition points where like something new is up ahead. And each one of those could be a wilderness season or mm-hmm. it could be a like, Oh great. We got to middle school and everything is great. All my friends are here. Everything is awesome. No, like <laughs> Elizabeth, no one has ever said the sentence. We got to middle school and everything was great. I'm going to have to respectfully <laughs> just, disagree with you. Just, yeah. Just like <laughs> That could happen. Like yeah. not ev- not every transition is a wilderness season, but that's one of the things that I observe for students, especially as they're approaching those seasons is the motions start to shift. Things start to get, you go from that certainty to uncertainty. Those things are naturally built in, yeah. um, which is helpful. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like kind of the maturing is like, okay, you can hold on to that as long as you want to, except all your friends aren't going to be there when you go to college. Like, yeah. So then like as parents, I think for one, knowing when those transitions are happening and kind of being prepared for the fact that transition and change is naturally going to bring up the like tumult of emotions. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, just within them, whether that's before like me or whether that's after as they're navigating a new situation, um, like, at being a parent and being aware of those transitions and anticipating those and praying about those and yeah. um, gathering people that maybe are a year or two ahead of you that can talk about those transitions, really helpful. Um, and I think I think when you're walking alongside of your kids, um, being able to help give them language for the things that they're experiencing sure. is really helpful. Um, not putting words in their mouth, yeah. but trying to provide opportunities to invite them to talk or name how they're feeling. Um, or, Hey, I, I saw this in you today. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me more about that? Mm -hmm. Um, or, or maybe no, they don't want to. Okay, fine. (laughs) Not the time, but, um, kind of practicing, um, the observation of like noticing what's going on in your kids and paying attention to how they're interacting with their friends or um, how they're interacting with you or changes in behavior. And then just, Hey, I noticed this. Yeah. What about that? Um, without giving, without the pressure of them, they having to respond. Mm-hmm. Um, cause you might ask that 10 times and then the 11th time they actually <laughs> answer. Um, that checks out. Yeah. But sometimes that helps. And also like other adults help too. Like, yeah. Um, in being able to name, the internal realities of what's going on, whether they're like approaching a transition or you're just noticing something that's going on within them. Yeah. I, w- I would imagine that one of the great privileges of the roles that you've occupied is, is you being one of those other adults, you being able to come alongside kids and help parents leave situations feeling more equipped than when they came in. Mm-hmm. Because what I'm hearing you say is you're, you're laying out a roadmap for parents of being aware of enough of what's going on in your kid's life from a a almost objective point of view. No one can be objective about their own children, but uh, it makes me think of, I have a dear friend who talked about when we were entering into the beginnings of the pandemic and the beginnings of the lockdown. And she said, we have to be, do what we need to do to be prepared um, to be soft for our kids because our kids are going to be really hard. And it was this that lived out for the sound we all just heard was all of the parents who were listening going like, yep, because that loss for teen and all of what we were all dealing with, like our kids felt that so acutely that we had to be equipped as parents, especially because we didn't have those other, as much access to those other adults in our lives to bear some of that burden, to absorb some of those things. So we had to go do the the walks by ourselves, the, we didn't care about what um, dessert we were or weren't having that particular day um, in that season for us. The other thing that you brought up that I want to dive into is on a macro level is this idea of what it means to be trusting God in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. And you gave this metaphor that I want to ask you to walk people through, which I loved because this is applicable in the wilderness, but it's also applicable in any season of our life. So when you talk about trusting God, 
what is what does that actually look like? So one of the things that um, kind of came across as I'm like looking at the wilderness and what the wilderness means in scripture is that wilderness is times of testing. Um, and my small group, we were wrestling with this, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Um, somebody brought it up to the group and was like, hey, I'm uncomfortable. This makes me uncomfortable to talk about God testing us. Sure. Let's talk about more, more about that. And so it was nice that a couple of weeks ago we had this like pre-conversation to kind of flesh some of this out. And then I was like, oh, this is coming up again. That's uh-huh. helpful. Yeah. Um, and, and so testing being about kind of revealing what's happening in the internal realities um, and trusting God is a hard thing to prove that you're doing until you're actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Um, Because you can say all day long that you trust God. You can say that you're a Christian. You can say that you're following Jesus. But if you've never actually had to prove that, how do you know it's really there? Like it's not even about other people seeing that in you. It's about knowing it's there for yourself. Like, it's a it's about your own life experience being able to reveal to you and remind you that God has shown up, mm-hmm. that God has done incredible things, <laughs> that God mm-hmm. is who he says he is and worthy of of being trusted. Um and so I think that's whether it's it's God, but that's what we're talking about, but also other people, like you don't you don't trust them until they've proven that they're worthy of your trust. Like trust yeah. is earned in a relationship in general. Um, for yourself and for the other person. Um, and I think what is remarkable to me when I read the scriptures is just how much God trusts us. Mm. That That's wild. <laughs> that's, that's wild to me <laughs> that like God would trust us with creation, that God would yeah. make us his representatives to the world, like, and continues to do so even when we mess up. Yeah. <laughs> that's wild to me. And I think f- what part of what we need as we journey with God and as we are following Jesus is to understand where our trust is at and how much we're trusting God. Do we have a line in the sand that we say we trust God until here? Yeah. But no further. On Sunday, you talked about this idea of we can trust a babysitter, but until we've that moment of actually handing off the child and then walking away and not texting the babysitter every 12 seconds, That is where that trust is actually lived out. Yeah, that's my. It's that came up because I was thinking about. Obviously, I'm gonna have a kid in the next two, three weeks. Yeah, sometime. Um, This will be one of those great moments to timestamp that and whatever, whenever the kid actually shows up. We'll see when she Mm -hmm. appears. Mm -hmm. Um, There are so many middle schoolers and high schoolers. They're like, "Oh, I can't wait to babysit." (laughs) And and. There are so many of them that I would trust you that. Like sure. So many of them that I would trust you that. But it's an ultimate level of my trust. Yeah. To actually call one of them, high schoolers that I've known since they were sixth grade. Yeah. And invite them to my house, and take this child, and then absolutely give it to them and walk out the door. Like that's a new level of trust, especially when I know have known these kids for six years, seven yeah. years. That's a wonderful picture. It's, you know, I keep coming back to this in our lived experience here because you are one of those people for my kids. And one of my favorite parts about growing, about raising my kids in a environment like this is being able to watch my kids establish some of these relationships first before I even am aware of, oh, this is a person I can trust. (laughs) Because I remember seeing uh, my son, especially he would come back with people and I'd be like, I don't know who this person is and have that moment of lack of trust and then watch as I could see how Isaac was trusting them, how Isaac was connecting with them, Mm -hmm. how they were seeing Isaac for who he is. And that broke down some of those walls for me. And now several of those people babysit ironically enough, but (laughs) You know, that's, those are, if I'm in the wilderness, it's important to keep these things in mind. But I think the other tension that you talked about a lot, which I think was really helpful is how much easier said that is than done. Yeah. Because 
particularly for those of us who are listening who are in an extended wilderness period. And like one of the things that I love so much that you talked about was this isn't necessarily this all encompassing big, deep, dark thing. It could just be a wilderness season in one particular area of your life. What are the ways in which we can, I'm going to use the phrase, identify that God is with us. And what are the ways in which we can try to find some sense of peace knowing that often God isn't going to just helicopter us out of the wilderness yeah. that the only way out is through. Yeah. The wilderness is hard. Um, and each wilderness season has its own length of time. And so I can look back at a few seasons in my life where I could say, okay, like the one I talked about on Sunday, I would say that was a three year world or not a three year, three, a three month wilderness season Mm -hmm. that feels pretty quick (laughs) in terms like in terms of like from the moment I made my decision to to break up with David to when we then got back together that was my wilderness season before then was just like struggling and suffering and I'm rejecting God and I'm not listening to that at all for context if you don't know Elizabeth David is her husband yeah thank you Ross um but then like the sort of break up, get to back, get back together season. What I would say is, was my wilderness season where I was actually intending to listen to God. Mm. Um, there are, I think for me, that's how I distinguish it. Not every wilderness season is like that. Yeah. Uh, for some people it's your wilderness and sometimes you're listening to God and sometimes you're not listening to God and sometimes you're just not sure who, where God is and what he's doing and if he's speaking at all. But I like that language, intending to listen as like being more aware of it. Yeah, because I think, that's that and that's the parallel that I see in Exodus is we have the the deliverance of Israel from Egypt and and that's for me a parallel to salvation like you know God's there you know Jesus has saved you like you're all in on following God that's not a that's not the question mm-hmm. the question in the wilderness season is will you continue to believe that God is good even when life is not Will you continue to believe that God is good even even when the things you know he's promised, you haven't quite seen those come to fruition yet? Yeah. Because for us, as we live in the in-between of the now and not yet, of that we know we are saved, we know that Jesus has come, but we also know he's coming again. And when he comes again, there will be full restoration of all things. Mm-hmm. And so as we live in the in-between, really our whole life is a wilderness because yeah. we're, we're waiting and listening to see what God is going to do next because we're all waiting for the final redemption. Yep. Big picture. Mm-hmm. But kind of in our lives as Christians, there, there can be seasons where sometimes we feel like everything is good, everything is flourishing. Um, and then there are other seasons where we're like, just not sure where God went or where he's, or where he's leading us. Yeah. Um, and so I feel like, what do you do in the wilderness? Um, one of the most important things for me has been to remember the whole story of God, of what God has done, like big picture, whole story of God, but also what God has done for me. This is where like journaling has been so helpful to me. I'm not a good journaler. I do like I irregular. I, um, a month ago journaled for the first time in three years. Sure. Okay. Um, maybe it's been a three year wilderness season. I'm not quite sure, (laughs) (laughs) but force myself to sit down and look back at these moments prior where I could see, Oh, that's what I was wrestling with. And Oh, now, Wow okay, God did that over the course of the last Mm -hmm. three years or the last two months or just having those moments in time for me where I can look back and say, oh, God has already done these things. He's already proved himself to me this many times. Mm -hmm. I don't know what's happening right now, but I know God doesn't change. Yeah. And then in continuing on, there's also for me remembering that like God doesn't leave me in the wilderness. God doesn't leave us in the wilderness. That's not the end of his story. It won't be the end of my story. So, okay, I guess I'll keep waiting. What's next? Yeah. Um, so yeah. I love this because you you started this by talking about how part of being able to talk, part of the challenge of being able to talk about anything related to mental health is you need to be able to have people who get it 
and people who have gone through it, but gone through it in a way where they can talk about it in such a way that it's helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Because not every story of ours is ready to be told. Correct. Yeah. Say it louder for the people in the back. Um, (laughs) But it makes me think about this idea of if we are not in the wilderness, and this is kind of where I want to land the plane here. If someone's been listening and they're like, "Ah, I'm things are pretty good over here. Things are pretty good over here. Things are pretty good over here. I would love for them to continue to do that level of introspection of there are wilderness seasons for us or wilderness areas for all of us. But one of the things that was so obvious in how you were walking people through this was you have entered the next wilderness seasons better equipped because of what you went through um, in the wilderness season that you were talking about. For my own life, thinking about ways in which God brought healing to a back injury that I had. Now, whenever my back hurts, I'm not as freaked out as I was when I was in that wilderness season. But what are some of the more kind of practical ways that you are able to bring that connective tissue? Because at least for myself, I think one of the first missteps I make in wilderness seasons is it's a, it's an immediate panic of yeah. oh oh here we go again yeah. rather than as you just said beautifully Crap, we're back yeah <laughs> as you just said beautifully remembering god's big story and remembering what god has done for us as individuals yeah um i think one of the things that has become so obvious to me and i think is obvious in in scripture too um kind of as i was looking at the different moments of desert seasons and encounters there that like what's happening in the desert is a revealing of internal reality. Um, it's a revealing of our identity (laughs) of who we are. And so, um, getting through desert seasons requires a lot of introspection, um, and a lot of opening of ourselves in order for God to do his work. Um, and so learning how to do that practically (laughs) is one of the things that helps in each new hardship, each new challenge, each new long season, because you can carry over some of those tools. Um, you know, what, um, what, you know, fills you with energy, (laughs) what fills you with life. Um, and you know, what drains you, um, and you can shift and make, and make, you know, your life changes because you're like, okay, well, I know that waking up at six 30 and going for a walk with my dog is a good thing to do, but I've been working up at eight o'clock. So maybe I should uh, (laughs) set my alarm earlier. Like there's like little, there's little habits that, you know, that you learn in each season of how to, how to be introspective and how Mm -hmm. to carve out that time and like take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the self care sorts of things. Um, and I think along with that, like there are other tools that you develop in the wilderness. Yeah. Um, other kind of, I talked about, um, that movement of the change of a, of a new identity of like going from a slave to becoming a, a follower of Jesus change of any new identity identity requires a, a hard wa- a rewiring of what's going on in your brain. Like you have to unlearn old habits and then learn new ones and you have to keep leaning into those new ones in each new wilderness season. Cause each new season is unraveling old ha- yep, bad habits, something, else we've learned, yeah. something that is, is not good. Um, in order for you to keep moving forward and keep being made more like Christ. Yeah. Um, and I, I say that also with a caveat that like not every wilderness season is completely an internal either. Like mm. that there are wilderness seasons that are brought on by sickness and there yeah. are wilderness seasons that are brought on by the loss of a job or the loss of a spouse or, um, wilderness seasons brought on by like world events, um, like big life changes, things that are happening in the world around us that all of a sudden cause our life to turn upside down. Um, and so like not everything can be solved by just the like contemplation. Yeah. Um, that's one way to like always be evaluating kind of like what's going on inside of me right now and Mm -hmm. what are the words I might use for it to talk to somebody else. Mm -hmm. Um, but also like life stuff happens and that also can be wilderness where God is teaching us new things. Um, or God is leading us in a new direction. And I think it's also important to be aware of how you're relating with God. Mm -hmm. Um, who's around you 
that's helping you with relate with God? Um, how are how are they helping to process and kind of figure out is God there? Is God there? Is that not God? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, yeah, I think those are some of the tools that I think about. Um, but I, I think other people might have other ideas of the things, other examples and stories of the things that have led them through the wilderness season. Cause at the end of the day, moving forward in a wilderness season is about continuing to walk step by step with God day by day with God. Like you get out of a wilderness season by continuing to follow God to wherever he's leading you, wherever that might be, if you, even if you don't like it. <laughs> um, yeah. Because it's good it, because the end is good for you. Like, because you know, the end of God's story is redemption. So wherever God has taken me right now, it's going to be good. I just got to figure out how to listen to God. And that's part of the challenge in the wilderness is a lot of time uh, we look at the Israelites and we say, Oh, they're, grumbling and complaining in the wilderness, but we see them thrive when instead of grumbling, they cry out to God. Yeah. And they're not just saying, Oh, this is awful, but this is awful. God, you need to do something about it. This is awful. God, come help me. (laughs) Like when, when we turn our grumbling to God, then we can be more aware of what next step God is asking us to take. And that, That's the key part of wandering in the wilderness is being able to turn to God instead of looking at the things around us and going, whoa, this is too much, is instead looking at him and being like, okay, this is too much, but I know that you're doing something, so show me what's next. Thank you for listening to the Encounter Faith Podcast. This podcast is a service of G. Shep Productions from Good Shepherd Lutheran Church in Naperville, Illinois. All rights reserved. If you're in the area, we'd love to meet you on a Sunday morning at our 9 a.m. or 1045 services. At Good Shepherd, we are inviting everyone to walk together in the calling of Christ for a life of eternal impact. This podcast is produced and hosted by me, Ross Cochran. And our theme song is Wake the Earth by 1111 Worship. Thank you for listening. We'll talk again soon.